<laughs> Bonjour, welcome to another live stream edition of Cafe de Rene. James here, joined once again by the star show, Mr. Rene Pre. Rene, you've brought a great guest today. Madames et messieurs, je vous souhaite la bienvenue au Carnival. And yes, I have a very, very, very special guest. Uh, all the way from now residing in Ecuador, he is the one, the only genius, sleeping Lanny Poffel. Bonjour, monsieur. Je suis le génie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what uh, Rick Martel told me to say to René Grolet. Je suis sans génie. Je suis sans génie? S-A-N-S, sans génie. That means you're without a genius, a genie. Yeah, that means that's what they call you when you're really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, you gotta, when you got a gimmick like the genius, you gotta take yourself a little lightly. Right, you know? right, right. So let's, uh, let's catch up. So for the fans who don't know, our families go back a long, long time. Back in the, since, what year did the, uh, you and your family come up here to the Maritimes. That was in 77? 78. 78. Okay. So let's but start with the story. Before huh? that, um, my father and Emil yeah. um, were in Indianapolis together. Mm. So, um, and you must have heard, I can't think of the guy's name right now, Les Ruffin. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, my father always liked Emil uh, for many, many reasons. So uh, I heard nothing but great things about your father from my father. Yeah. And of course, uh, my father passed away in uh, 2010 on uh, March 4th. And then my brother died one year after on May 20th of 2011. And then I took care of my mother for six years until she finally passed in 2017 on June the 3rd. Yeah. So even though I knew I wanted to go to Ecuador for my retirement, I would have never walked out on her. Right. I, had to, I waited until, uh, until I had no more responsibility for her. Right. Yeah, that's what she took care of me when I needed her. Right. And uh, I figured it was the least I could do. That's one thing about the powerful family. You guys were super, super tight as a family, right? And oh yes, we were, we were tight. And I was, uh, I always thought. Did you ever see The Godfather? Uh, a long time ago. Okay, you need to watch it recently, because my I always thought my father was like Don Vito Corleone, and my brother was like Sonny Corleone. Yeah. <laughs> and I was hoping, I was hoping I could be like Michael Corleone. <laughs> but it turned out I was like Fredo. <laughs> that made me very sad. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, so let's talk about, so Indianapolis, they were together. Was that for Dick the Bruiser or was that for a different promoter? No, that was for Jim Barnett. Oh, was Barnett running that territory then? Okay. My boy. My boy. <laughs> it's all sold out. Losing money is such a bore. Right. Yeah. I, I got to meet him. Just before he passed away, uh, I was working for WWF, and then he was backstage, and then he was telling me stories about my dad. He said, your dad was such a good worker, but he was so cheap. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, um, that's what they call you, you know? It's, you know, like, uh, but when you, when you talk about me, you can say I'm cheap, or you can say I'm the real-life Ted DiBiase. Ah, yeah, I remember you telling me that story. He goes, do you remember uh, me and Lanny had talked on the phone? This was a few years ago. And he goes, my my father loved me very much, and so did my brother. And you remember the Million Dollar Man? I go, yeah. He goes, I took his gimmick. <laughs> yeah. See, uh, he looked like a million dollars, and I don't, unless it's green and wrinkly. Right. But the thing is, it's all about... A lot of these wrestlers, you talk, you ride with them and you hear three things, pleasure, power, possession. Mm. Even Ric Flair, who's 10 times the worker I am, or 20, or 100, but he's all pleasure, power, and possession. Mm. I'm about health, wealth, and freedom. Mm. That's why this month I'm going to be 68 years old, 
And I asked, I asked this girl, do I look like I'm going to be 68? She said, no, but you used to. <laughs> Why? Well, I don't get it. Why? It's, it's a joke, see? Oh, okay. I, I said, no, I don't look 68, but maybe five years ago I did, or oh. 10 years ago. It's a joke. Well, it's a joke so, yeah. you know, you got to yeah. take yourself lightly if you're going to be the genius. That's right. So anyway, um, it's health, wealth, and freedom. Health comes first. Wealth is next. And freedom, uh, in my, let's put it this way, uh, to wake up every morning and you're not married. Wow, what a freedom. <laughs> <laughs> the people say, why did you go to Ecuador? And I said, well, when you're divorced, you don't have to call anybody up, anybody up and ask permission to go anywhere. Right. You just you look in the bathroom mirror and say, self, where do I want to go? Right. And if Ecuador doesn't tickle my fancy, we'll try Argentina next or Chile or someplace else. But um, at least I've got my passport. I've got my cedula, which is an ID. And I've got my visa. So they can't get rid of me no matter what happens. <laughs> So let's talk about your time in the Maritimes. Um, so in 78, uh, yourself, your father, Angelo, and Randy, and Judy, your mom, you all came up here and worked. Was it the full season, the, the full summer? It was for me. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Randy cool. and, my, and my dad, yeah, we were the full season. Okay. Everybody else was half season. Right, right. Because your then, father would say things like, is it okay to imitate him? Sure. <laughs> holy, holy Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the midgets, the midgets draw money. I can prove it. So, <laughs> by, the way, by the way, I heard something uh, about two weeks ago. Is it true that Clifford died? Uh, ty, uh, Farmer? Yeah. Little Clifford, yeah. He was, what a fantastic um, guy he was. Oh, he was, he was, he was like a big uh, father figure to me. He used to take me driving in his car because he had the blocks, right, to drive. Yeah. And then uh, he actually taught me how to drive stick shift when I was a kid. And um, yeah, for those who don't know, Little Clifford was Farmer Brooks. He was a local uh, midget wrestler here. And uh, yeah. him and Sky Lolo, man, they would, every season they come in and they steal the show. Yeah, and he just passed away. And I'm, yeah. That yeah and, uh, I'm thinking to myself, uh, we can't say midget anymore. It's little people. Right. Yeah, I apologize for all the little people out there. Um, we're stuck in the old days where it was called midget yeah, wrestling. I'm going to tell you, I got... I was, have you ever been to Orlando, Florida? Yeah. Yes, of course. Okay. I was, I can't go back to Disney World. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I got beat up, I got beat up by a midget. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Is uh, that, here, here's, uh... what, here's what happened. I was texting and driving uh... and I bumped into a car right in front of me and I pull over. And out comes a midget, and he goes right up to me, and he says, I'm not happy. And I said, okay, which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> you, might, you might get us banned. I, get us I, I that. <laughs> that's, after that, I considered them little people. Little but, people. Now, when I told that joke, and uh, do you know I had saw Jim Duggan? Yeah. He goes around doing comedy. And he, he said, really? he, he laughed so hard at my joke about, I'm not happy. Okay, which one are you? And for those of you that don't get it, there's happy, grumpy, sleepy, sneezy, um, doc, bashful, and and grumpy. Hmm. Okay, I, I maybe I messed it up, but I know some of them. Because right. uh, I used to read that to my daughter. And uh, so it's still in there somewhere. But anyway... Uh, Duggan said, hey, I do comedy. Would you mind if I use that joke? And I said, hey, um, I stole it first. And it'd be, even <laughs> it'd be even funnier with him because he's bigger than me. Right. And and um, even though it'd be really funny if he lost to a midget, you know, Duggan, you know, right, <laughs> hey, right. tough guy. You know. <laughs> yeah. I think we have our first super chat. Now, what we do here is a lot of fans uh, – Sending questions and and you mind answering them? Is it okay? Okay, if I don't want to answer it, I won't. That's it. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Krogan, say I have to say your brother was a total pimp for that Spider-Man row. Bone saw is ready. Stay safe, Lanny. You are also a badass. 
<laughs> okay, what is a total pimp? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. Um, I think it's a good thing, yeah. It yeah, means... good thing. Okay, I'll take that as a good thing. Yeah. Um, if it's a bad thing, I would love to be a total pimp in a movie like that. Yeah. And if it's a good thing, thank you. Yeah. Merci and gracias. Gracias. Yeah, man. Uh, your your brother, man, when he did that movie, I remember seeing it. It was like, holy Christ. He was like a total beast in there, man. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe he was uh, doing some medicine for that movie. I, I, if I was a betting man, I think so too. But yeah, yeah. It, at that time, steroids was illegal, so he was taking HGH, human growth hormone, which was legal. Mm. And it's, I guess, it works from from the results that I saw. Yeah, whatever he was taking worked it definitely. But if life. you look at the final move when he when he kind of like pow drives himself into the mat, yeah. And they offered him a stunt double, but Randy was too manly for that. Right. He said, oh, I'm going to do it myself. Yeah. So, boom. And he hurts himself. And they said, beautiful. Do it again. They did it 10 times. Oh. In, in the, uh, the next day, he gets up in the morning and he tries to go to the bathroom. And he couldn't get out of bed. He said, oh, I, I think I got Christopher Reeves, which was Superman. And right, he right. fell off a horse and broke his cervical first vertebrae. Yeah, yeah. And um, it should have killed him, but it didn't until later. But uh, that's, you know, that's giving your all to whatever you're doing, you know. Right, right. And he didn't think that a stunt double could take the bump that he could anyway. And <laughs> his arms wouldn't be as big and whatever. Right. That's definitely. Right. So yeah, it's one thing I never got to meet your brother, man. He passed away before I ever got a chance to meet him. But like, well, um, in your the brother got to meet him. He's like, holy Jesus Christ! Um, you know the midgets are digging to draw money. I tell you, they, they, <laughs> I, can, I can prove it. Ah, <laughs> uh, I remember you hearing uh, hearing you on another interview. Like your uh, my dad and your brother, they didn't get along very well. No. Well, oil and water. Right. Um, and uh, the thing is, I was out of it. I didn't, uh, all I wanted to do was, I believed it's a team sport. Let's draw money and let's, let's divide it up. Let's go great. It was, it was all good. But um, Randy was probably alpha male. And me, I'm kind of beta. Well, I'm alpha now because I have nobody to compare myself to. So, you know, just hanging around Ecuador, I seem like the alpha, you know, and um, the thing is, everybody wants the talents to draw, and everybody's got a different idea on how to make that happen. So that's where at least they were, they're both wanting the same thing. And nowadays, you know, um, see, one of the great things I do is I don't watch much television, right. you know, because I don't want to hear about um, any I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to hear about Trudeau, Biden, you know, or anybody. I just, in 12 years, I'm going to be 80 if I'm lucky. And I would like to make it to 100. And I figure the best way I can do that is to be happy, enjoy my life, and not worry about things that I cannot control. Yeah. And nowadays, it doesn't matter if you vote or when you vote or who you vote for. It matters who's counting the vote. And you have no control. That's it. You're right. Yeah. I think we have another story, uh, another question here, a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any funny Andre stories? Well, now that he's gone, I can tell a few, but I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, um, Randy and Andre didn't get along at all. Oh, really? All right. Yeah. And the reason was baby oil. I oh. said no baby oil. And oh. Randy's answer was, yeah, your gimmick is being a giant. My gimmick is baby oil. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, you know, it could be easy or hard with Andre. Yeah. And wouldn't it be great if it was just easy? Yeah. But no, it was hard. Because, and, and I, I told Randy, I said, why don't you just make an exception for Andre 
and not use baby oil in his matches. And you'll get along so much easier and better. Right. And Randy says, I'm not going to say any bad words, but Link, you. <laughs> he says, <laughs> says whose side do you want? He says, if I make an exception for him, I got to make it for everybody. I said, but he's a giant. He yeah. says, I don't care what he is. You know. Wow. He, he says, he may be a giant, but he's not giant all over. And I tell you, about I said, oh, I don't want to hear it. Wow. Wow. So did uh, did you and Andre get along pretty good? Yeah. Let me tell you why I got along with Andre. Okay. And you're going to call me whatever you're going to call me. Mm. Um, but, but there's a thing where you kiss the posterior, uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Go ahead and get it over with. Um, it was December 28th, my birthday. It was 1985. So I just turned 31. I go into the Buffalo Auditorium. I bet that was torn down before you ever got to Buffalo. Yeah. But it was an old, miserable building with a lot of history. And I promise you the snow was this high uh, in Buffalo. Okay. And so what happens is, and by the way, Toronto always laughs at Buffalo because even though Toronto was further north, uh, Buffalo gets the lake effect and they get, they get all the snow. Mm. So Toronto laughs at Buffalo. That's the big joke. Okay. So my point is, I get there early and everybody's there early because it's a blizzard. And Pat Patterson sees me and he says, boy, look at poor Andre. He's going to be here for four hours and he doesn't have a deck of cards. So when Andre's in trouble, I am not slow. It's hip, hip, hip. And away I go. <laughs> I go out there and I find... There's about 20 arena rats hanging around that door. I got the least attractive one. And I said, come here, please. I said, here's $10. Please go to uh, any place in Buffalo and come back with a deck of playing cards. And she says, oh, okay, I'll do it. And I said, as soon as you come back, tell this Andy Fran Usher. And, and I, I got him and he will tell me uh, down the stairs to come on up and we can do that. So it was, it didn't take her long. And she came back like the abominable snowman. She was like, she had been in a blizzard. She gives me a bag and it wasn't just playing cards. It was bicycle, the finest in the world. Oh, okay. So poor Andre is sitting there. He's looking sad, miserable. And, you know, he had a bad back. He was, he was yeah. in terrible. The Andre of the 70s was a great worker. The Andre of the 80s was a horrible, uh, painful, uh, and the opponent had better do it all because he couldn't anymore. Right. He couldn't he could in his younger days. I said, Andre, voila. And he looks at me, and a tear comes into no his shit. eye. And he says, merci beaucoup, monsieur. And he, and he grabs me by my... You know, I got a big head, but he has big, his fingers yeah. were this big. And he had me and he gives me the kiss here and a kiss here. I knew better than to fight him. <laughs> okay. And I was just glad that's all they wanted. Right. So, <laughs> so anyway, from then on, he called me boss man. A couple of years go by and he says, Lenny, come to my room. I said, uh-oh. He says, I, I got to go to his room. He says, Lenny, anything on the menu you want, please. He says, uh, and so I get room service. I get uh, red wine and everything's nice and this and that. And, and then he takes a VHS tape, puts it in, and guess what it was? The Princess Bride. Yes, and it was before anybody got a chance to see it. Oh wow. wow! Yeah, it was a it was on videotape right. before the movie came out. Oh. So I'm watching, and he keeps looking at me to see what I'm reacting, and I kept doing that. And uh, then he said, "Lenny, what did you think of my performance?" And I said, "Andre, it sucked. You are horrible." 
No, I yeah, that. right. You're no better than that. I said, Andre, it was fantastic. You are the greatest. Um, nobody could have done that but you, and that's true. Yeah. Who's going who's gonna to play that role? Right. But Andre the Giant, they, they built that role for him. Yeah. So then here's the next problem. Every night he would say, Lonnie, come to my room. He'd feed me again. We'd play the, watch the movie again. He'd ask me what I thought again. Wow. So I think I, I can't remember if I was there six or seven times. And then I realized I cannot say no to this man. Right. Okay. And if, if he didn't like my baby, oh, I wouldn't have, I promise you, I would have drank it before I put it on, <laughs> you know? So, so then I did, I said, I can't say no to him. And I just can't watch that movie again. It would have been more interesting if I was in it, right, but right. Since I wasn't. So what I did was I hid from him. And about five days later, he said, Lonnie, I've been looking all over for you. I said, oh, she's, uh, he's got me. So I don't know how many times I was in his, but I gained a lot of weight from that. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of interesting. Now you tell me that story. You think Andre had um, like loneliness issues? You think he was a lonely guy? Well, I have no idea what it's like to be that big right. and go out and everybody stares at you. Mm. And um, he had friends like Tim White, but Tim White wasn't always there. Right. And Tim, Tim White just passed away about yes. six months ago. Yeah, Did right. you know him? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome guy. Great guy. Yeah, everybody liked him. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, probably lonely. I bet there's a lot of psychological problems associated with being a giant, mm. you know. So, um, but he was, he either loved you or didn't, you know. Yeah. With, and uh, with, if you check out, rest, go, go on my uh, website, thegeniuslannypapo.com, you'll see there was a battle royal. I took a headbutt, he threw me out of the ring, and I had blood on NBC. Oh, okay. To get him, to get him ready as a heel for Hulk Hogan for 93,000 people. Yeah. So anyway, that was my station in life. And um, my big payoff, number one, I didn't make the card. Number two, I didn't get a bonus in my money. Number three, <laughs> yeah. So the only thing, the honor of having served the WWE right. was, my, was my reward. Let me ask you a question. Like um, when I was there, like I got a a, a a payday for just being at WrestleMania. Did you get one of those back then or no? Like I, I didn't uh, for WrestleMania twenty one. I wasn't on the card, but I got paid just to be there. No, they didn't do that for me. Oh, okay. And now the hell with it. I'm leaving. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Let's put it this way: all's all's well that ends well. Yeah. Okay. And if your passive income is greater than your monthly expenses, the game's over and you win. Okay? Uh, you are the genius, Lanny. Well, the thing is, um, your father had all these properties and all these monthly payments. And when anybody didn't know, get along with him or didn't agree with him or call them names, it was just jealousy. Mm. And the thing is, your dad had... And I, I'll tell you what, he was my hero, too. I knew that as soon as I had my passive income, taking care of my expenses. Now, in Ecuador, they use U.S. US currency. Mm. They also do it in Panama. But those are the only two places I can think of in South America that does that. Okay, and um, as long, I'll tell you what, if you wanted to come, a young people like yourself, and you wanted to come in here and try to make money, I say, don't come. You can't make money here, okay? Please don't come. But if you're 65 and over and have no interest in working ever, you can live like a king for just a little money. Uh, because, do you know how much the people make here? $400 a month. You thought I was going to say a week. Um, $400 a month. That is not a lot of money. So the prices are low enough so the people can survive. Right. Now, they say it isn't, but I'll tell you what. 
this is only a good place to go if you're retired. Okay. And uh, when you're ready for that, or you're interested in better weather, you know, I know you love where you live right now, Yeah. but so do I. As long as you have a passport, come to Quito. I know where all the good restaurants are. Okay. I might take you up on that, pal. Okay. Let's get, let's get to some of these super chats. Yeah. Uh, great question there from uh, Chris Actor. Uh, were there any plans for the Genius and Mr. Perfect tag team title reign? Thank you for being one of the top heels of all time. That would have been good. That would have been really cool. Okay. The thing is, they were about to fire me. I had been five years as Leaping Lanny. Yeah. And my, my gimmick was getting tired. Right. So um, we are in Boston, Massachusetts. And... They bring me into the dressing room, and I knew it didn't look good for me. I could sense it. Come here with Vince wants to talk to you. Rot row. <laughs> and he says, and there's a there were several people in the room, and he's in case I want like nails, right? Right. Remember? Right. Yeah. Of course, I'm I'm the least possible guy to do that. Right. Okay, and and uh so what happened was Lanny, you're a great employee. You're always on time. You never miss a shot. We thank you for all these years of service, but we've got too many baby faces. We need heels. And I said, why don't you make me a heel? And Chief J. Strongbow. <laughs> okay. Chief J. Strongbow right. said, uh, did you get the? I got it. I, I was got a little it. subtle, but you know. I, I, I got it, Okay. Yeah. Chief J. Strombo says, well, you can't be a heel. You're too good looking. And I said, you were a baby face for 35 years, and you are the ugliest man I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody laughed, but I wasn't laughing. Okay. You're being serious. So, so I said, okay, watch me tonight. I'll turn heel. Because I had a gimmick where I would um, read the poem and throw the Frisbees to the crowd. So... I came to the ring and I'm, I said, oh my God, I, I've talked big, now I gotta back it up. And I said, what can I say to the people of Boston to make them hate me? And I said, my name is Lanny Poffo. I always know what's up. The Bruins haven't got a chance to win the Stanley Cup. And the people went, oh. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> The Red Sox haven't won in years. I hope they never do. The Celtics are a travesty. The Patriots are too. And I'm starting the third verse, and a and a a fan goes and tries to get into the ring. No shit. And, and I always said to myself, um, never give a sucker an even break. So I catch him between his head between the second and third rope, and I caught him, and he went flying. Wow. Now I'm exaggerating a little. He didn't right. go flying. He just fell. Right. <laughs> but the thing is, if he had gotten into the ring yeah. moments later, it'd be a fair fight. I don't like to fight fair. Okay. I like to catch it coming into the ring. Boom. Boom. So I got him. And then I start the third verse, and another fan jumps in the ring. This time, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, its finest, the police come, and we had a semi-riot. The match never took place. They... They put us back, and so now I'm feeling pretty pumped up, okay? And Vince says, well, it looks like you're not as good-looking as we thought. Right. He says, uh, you got any ideas for a gimmick? I said, yes, how about boy genius? And, he, and I said, and I still do the poems, but they're bad like tonight. Mm. And boy genius, and wear a cap and gown, and, you know, be obnoxious like the guy in class that says, oh, me, me, you know. So right. he says, okay, but not boy genius. We'll call you the genius Lanny Popple. We'll do six vignettes, and then we'll drop the name Lanny Popple and just call you the genius. And I said, nothing doing, Vince. It's got to be my way or that's it. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I no, worked for him too, pal. I, I, I said, mwah. No, don't. I joined the Kiss My Ass Club, but there was no TV cameras. Right. right. Okay. So anyway, now the thing is, I was so happy 
to get, but here's what I didn't realize. I don't know if you can see it, but on my knuckle, there's a scar. Wait a minute. I can't, I can't see it. I can't see it, but I'll take your word for it. Okay. Okay. I was so happy that when I woke up in the morning, I didn't even, I didn't know what had happened, but my hand was as big as a boxing glove. Oh, it was from punching the fan? Because I hit him in the tooth, I guess. Oh. And so all those germs got into my... Right. right. So I freaked out, and I took myself to the emergency room, and they said, good thing you came, otherwise we might have had to amputate your hand. So they gave me some shots to kill those germs, and it went down. But never hit a guy in the mouth, and then... And then not put, uh, what do you call that? Uh, Disinfectant or something? Alcohol? Something was, it's, um, I can't think of it. Something that makes it bubble. Oh, probably, um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what do they put on the... Uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, boy, my hand got fat and I had to... Uh, Wow, that was that was pretty bad. But as they say, like a uh, human bite is like one of the most um, dirtiest things because of all the bacteria in our mouth, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, wow. And nowadays, you know, with all those COVID germs, you never know what you're going to get. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, let's get to some more questions. Hydrogen peroxide. There you go. Yeah, I'm all just right. reading the fans. Thank you, fans. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, HPK's lazy eye. Why did you sit out your entire WCW contract, even though you were paid? But did Bischoff or the road agents ever reach out to you when NWO got popular? Well, thank you for. By the way, let me go back to the last question. Um, Mr. Perfect and I, um, oh, yeah. I had absolutely no, um, nothing to do with what was going to happen. I just got the news third hand, and it was just to do stuff. And uh, actually, Mr. Perfect, um, he was going to have Bobby Heenan as the manager, but it was Hulk Hogan that wanted to work with me because he thought I had a hilarious gimmick. Uh, he actually came to me and he says, uh, Lanny, you're, you're wrestling like a blank. Um, uh, let's see, what are we... What do we call that in uh, French Canada? A fifi. A fifi. I was a fifi. I said, do you want me to stop? He says, no, I love it. I want you, can, as a matter of fact, can you turn the dial up? Uh, and I said, yes, I can. He says, would you mind if I mocked you? I said, nothing doing. I'll get away from me. No. Yes, you can mock me. So anyway, um, so that's that. Um, it was supposed to be Bobby Heenan and Mr. Perfect. But I knew that as soon as the run with Hogan was over, it was going to go to Bobby Heenan. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. That was the greatest manager that ever lived, in my opinion. Me too. There are some people that think the Grand Wizard was also great, but that was in the 70s. Okay, so it's very hard to compare them. Right. So anyway, I hope that answered the question before. Now about this question, um, yes, it's true. It, but here's what happened previous, and people that tell this story, leave this out. I want to come clean on your cafe, coffee shop, cafe. <laughs> cafe de Rene. <laughs> cafe de Rene. Okay. Before that happened, right before, yeah. Randy came to the WCW and brought something with him from the WWE. Take a guess. Slim Jim contract. Thank you. And I'm talking $750,000 per year for the WCW. Wow. wow. So right after that, it was then easy for Randy to bring a picture of his lesser talented brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, after we're done, I'll send you a screenshot of me with the gimmick. And... Maybe you can uh, paste it up or post it. Oh, or I think I see. Is that when you had the bleach blonde hair? Oh, yes. Did he want to call you Gorgeous George? Your brother did? Yes, he wanted me to be Gorgeous George. Now, ask me if I would have gotten over. I think you could have pulled it off. 
Here's what happened. Okay. My hair started falling out. No. And then I looked like, instead of looking like Gorgeous George, I looked like the scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> it was it was just not going to happen. That is a tough gimmick to uh, to do every night. I mean, you could do it one night, but then when it's, I tell you what, and I got it professionally dyed, but see, as you can see, I have silver hair on this temples yes. and uh, dark hair here. Yes. In those days, it was all dark. Right. And you have to, when they dyed it, bleached it, it was turned red first, and then it took a long time to get it white. Right. So I tell you what, it was, um, it was just another instance where my brother took care of me. Oh. But he says, but you got to earn this. Every time he saw me, he wanted to see my physique and my tan and to see if I was in shape, you know, to see if I was loafing because that phone's going to ring and you better pick it up and you better be ready. Well, the phone never rang and I was working out in case the phone ring rang, but I was also working out because I didn't want Macho Man to think that I wasn't trying hard. You're slacking, yeah. Yeah, wow. so I would do three extra reps after I was done. Right. And now that I'm retired in <laughs> Ecuador, I do three less reps. <laughs> and five less sets. And five less sets, right? Yeah. You got some more um, questions. Yeah, I've got one before we go back to Super Chats, uh, Laddie. Um, tag team I liked, but we haven't really spoke about is the Beverly Brothers and you as their manager. Any fun Beverly Brothers story? And what was they like to work with? Well, they're both from Minnesota, and so is Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning. Yes. And Kurt, unfortunately, passed away at the age of 44, was it? Yeah. Yes, something about that, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Kurt was fantastic, and I loved being with him. Uh, big ribber. But, you know, nobody ribbed me, and guess why? Your brother. Ooh, you want to answer to the macho man? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing with my little brother? Yeah. You know? So anyway, uh, they were very talented and excellent, and I was just glad. Uh, I was just glad to be back. I was. Uh, I took six months off after they let me go. You know they do that. They don't send you an "I love you" letter. They right. just. They just let you go. And then, uh, Chris, uh, John Tolis was their manager. He's, he's the coach with a whistle. Right. And, right, right. Uh, yes. Somebody used his suitcase for a toilet. And he got mad and he said, whoever did that, I'll set fire to your house with your children in it, you know? And he went crazy and quit or fired, who knows? So that left an opening for the Beverly Brothers. They called me. So um, we did our best and uh, it was, uh, they were good guys. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to see them. Um, I don't know the exact date, but. Somewhere in New Jersey, Morristown, New Jersey, in a couple of months, uh, there's going to be a tribute to the Macho Man. They wanted me to oversee it and make my speeches. And um, I heard that the Beverly Brothers are going to be there. So fantastic. Cool. You know, old, old Lang Syne. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, one more question. You, men um, you mentioned Randy. I heard a story, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if it was a WrestleMania or something, Brutus Beefcake cut your hair in the ring, and that wasn't planned. And uh, When you got backstage, Randy confronted Brutus Beefcake, is that true, or is that just a rumor? Well, that's what Beefcake said. Right. His, me his memory, I don't think he's lying, I just think he can't remember the truth. Ah. Uh, okay. Yeah. See, what happened was, in a pay-per-view before that, in, uh, do you remember when I wrestled Beefcake and he says, I'll just cut a little bit of your hair? I said, no, get a big swatch of it and cut it off. Because I figured it would get a bigger pop. I also figured that if we had a typical Beefcake match, it would suck. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I've never been I've never been shy I've never been shy about uh doing cheap things to get over. Right. So so anyway, and then when I was wrestling 
it was me and Mr. Perfect against Hulk Hogan and Brutus Beefcake. Uh, I'll tell you what, that was like my biggest run in the WWE, main event after main event. And uh, he would always cut off a swatch of my hair in the match. So by the time I got to WrestleMania, I already looked like um, somebody that was taking cancer medication. Right. You know, uh, you know, your hair falls out and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I can't even remember what that is. Uh, what what is chemotherapy? Chemotherapy. I look like a chemo patient. I swatches of hair going everywhere. And um, I had stolen an idea anyway. I figured they were going to cut my hair. Although Chief J. Strombo has one thing to do, tell you the finish. And he can't even do that. Okay? <laughs> so I wanted them to cut the rest of my hair. I, was, I couldn't wait for them to do it because I remember after I was in the Maritimes, I went to work for Don Owen in Portland and Washington, yeah. uh, or Oregon and Washington, and the hottest heel they had at the time was Playboy Buddy Rose. Buddy Rose, yes, yes. And he he had lost a haircut match, yeah. and he had a blonde wig for promos, and he wore a mask in the ring, with his blonde hair coming out. Now I figured, I would wear. I got some. I got some wigs. Right. Okay. And then I got the amateur wrestling ear guards to keep the, to keep the boys from you know, yeah. messing with it, you know? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, in my opinion, that got over better than anything because I was, you know, they would try to pull my hair and I was, no, no, you know, right. it, it was, you know, I think um, putting smiles on faces is, was the job of the genius. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. I was, I was that type of heel. Yeah. Oh, you were definitely a great heel. And plus a great baby face, too. You're so underrated. Like, I watched your old matches, like, in the garden and stuff. And just, like, you were an innovator for that time, especially, like, springboards and moonsaults. And, I mean, Jesus. Well, everybody says, Lanny, did you invent the moonsault? And I said, yes, I did. Right after I saw Tiger Mask do it to Dynamite right. Kid. Right. And right. It right the next day. <laughs> right. And may I say, I never, never was as good at it as as the original Tiger Mask. So do you think was Tiger Mask that originated it or was it Edouard Carpentier? Who 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 would be the first? Well Carpentier, the only thing I saw him do is get on the top rope and land on his feet. Uh, I never saw him turn it into a splash. Right. But what Carpentier did was that front somersault. Boom. Yeah. Wow was yes. that great. Yeah. You see, don't forget, I was just a mediocre gymnast where Carpentier represented France in the Olympics in gymnastics. Yeah. So he was a phenomenal person and a very, very, also a tough guy too. <clears throat> I mean, you call him short, you know, you're in trouble. Because <laughs> he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Right. All right uh, super chat here. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, hey, Lenny, who's the stiffest ah. wrestler you've ever faced? Good question. I would have to say big boss man. Really? Really? Yes. Um, he kept, they used me to get him over. I was in his enhancement talent. And of all places to get over, Newfoundland. Okay. Wow. If you set fire to the arena, nothing would happen in Newfoundland. <laughs> you know, because you're, so, um, so he would take me in this, this horrible, he's very strong, you know, and he would take me and, throw me on my head and, was, and then oh in the morning I woke up and I said please can you quit doing that no I gotta do it I gotta get over I said you're in Newfoundland you couldn't possibly get over I mean <laughs> it's not gonna happen there's no TV cameras right right you know right and he kept doing it and doing it and I kept hating it and hating it yeah. and then I was so glad when it was my time to be no more big boss man yeah. And then when I, when I finally get the break as the genius and I'm wrestling in the main events with Hulk Hogan and Beefcake, every other match wasn't 
wasn't Beefcake. It was Hulk Hogan and the Big Boss Man. Oh, shit. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> I, I said, I got to take that thing again. And I finally confronted him and I said, listen, you are hurting me. And he says, yeah, but I saw you do it with Arn Anderson. And I said, yes. And Arn Anderson is much better than you are. <laughs> wow. You know, I mean, a lot better. And um, <clears throat> so, see, everybody thinks that Iron Mike Sharp was this. Iron Mike Sharp was the stiffest guy in wrestling. Right. But he would never hurt you. He would just whack you. Right. And but Iron Mike was the cleanest man in wrestling. I heard he had like really bad OCD, right? Oh man, lather, rinse, repeat, baby, lather, <laughs> rinse, repeat. And uh, he he would. Uh, we were driving together one night, and I get out in a gas station. I get out, use the bathroom, go to the food store. When I came back, he's still doing this with his pants. I said, Mike, there's nothing on your pants. You know, he's he's getting the lint off his pants or whatever he's doing. He never got out of the car. He was still wow. still dusting himself off, dusting. But it, at least by the time he was done with his grooming, at least he looked good. Right. Yeah. That's one thing in wrestling, man. You meet so many different characters. And now that we're more aware of, like, mental health issues, I think a lot of wrestlers have different types of mental health issues, right? Yeah, he was OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah, my brother was OCD. One cool dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got some more questions there, right there, James. Yeah, this one's gonna be a good one. Uh, what's the funniest Mister Perfect rib you've seen? Well, there was ribs that I heard about, but um, the one, the one I wasn't there for this, but he was underneath the ring. And he got there before the fans did. And he had some communication when he was going to get out from under the ring and um, beat up somebody, I guess. Okay. So um, what happened was he had to go potty. You know, it's a long time to be underneath the ring. Right. So he just relieves himself. We're talking about numero do. do oh, okay? shit. And um, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But they say that was, uh, and he says, I guess my shit didn't get over. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's funny. So uh, how long did you and Mr. Perfect stay together as a unit, like, uh, or a team? Like, Let me see. I'm going to say four months. Four months. And I'd say four months of main events um, and two main events in Madison Square Garden. And, you know, people say, you just said I was underrated. But you know what? It was worth it to um, suck hind tit on the sow for as long as I did just yeah. to get that four months of main events. Yeah. And I've well, got selective amnesia. I only want to remember the good times, never the bad. Right. So, I mean, main event, uh, that was with Hogan. Hogan and Beefcake in the in the garden. Hogan and Beefcake, or Hogan and Big Boss Man, they would alternate it. Wow, and that was so, that must have been sold out against right? Mr. Perfect and the Genius. Wow. And um, I'll tell you what, it was fun for the fans, great for me, and I loved being in it. And I just, uh, it was the best part of my career by far. People say, do I prefer Leaping Lanny or the Genius? Um, if I could wrestle as Leaping Lanny, I didn't always have a good match, but I always had a great match with Bob Orton Jr. And I always had a great match with Terry Funk. Yeah. And you see, those were the Harley race. Yeah. They were the ones that could elevate me. Yeah. Uh, and I would, I would look better losing to them than beating Barry Horowitz. Right, right, right. Now, I'm not knocking Barry, but he doesn't know how to get heat. He thought he was a wrestling heel, and he did that on his shoulder. And it got over with nobody. Uh, See, the heel has got to get heat. Yeah. And if he doesn't, what we have is a dead match. Right. And uh, I don't want to be in a dead match. 
I seen some matches with you and Jake the Snake too. Those were excellent, excellent matches. Oh, uh, thank you. I'll tell you what, poor Jake. Do you know that? Um, I don't want to knock him or put myself over. I think he's a great interview, great worker, great mind for the business. Yeah. But don't be amazed when I tell you that I am older than Jake, and he looks like he could be my grandfather. Wow. Are you guys really? Oh, really? I didn't realize. I am older than guys... Jake Roberts, yes. Wow. So you're going to be 68. And he must be at least, what, 65, 66? He's, he, he's, I think he's, uh, I'm 67. I think he's 66. Oh. You know, he's, he's close to my age, but he's, I, yeah. I just, when I look at him, I say, God damn. You know, well, I don't know. When he lost all that weight with DDP and he died himself up, I mean, he looked pretty good. Well, that's the thing. DDP is a walking saint for doing what he did to help his friends. And yeah. I think it's fantastic because no matter how, what bad shape you're in, you can always resurrect like a phoenix from the ashes. And I think it's great that he did that. And uh, I know that oh, Scott Hall just passed. And, yeah. you know, it's, but the thing is, you can only do so much. That just shows how important. <clears throat> Like uh, nutrition is to one's health, right? Like diet. Yeah. yeah. I'm living on a diet of greens, onions, mushrooms, beans, berries, and seeds. Also, drinking, there's Ecuador has an amazing, uh, very crazy fruit, uh, fruits that you've never heard of. Go after we're done talking, go on Google and look up fruits of Ecuador. You see my okay. picture. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> also, you're a vegan, Lenny? No, I'm a vegan that cheats. Okay. <laughs> so so what I do is if the fish is good, I'll have a little fish. Right. If, uh, if, if I'm in Texas or Colombia or uh, I mean Colombia, South America, yeah. uh, they're famous for their meat. I'll have a little meat. Right. Uh, but I won't overdo it. In other words, you've got to enjoy yourself. And so um, I start every morning with celery juice, uh, 32 ounces of celery juice. And then I, on an empty stomach, and then I go to the park, and I don't run, I walk, because I don't want to be a face plant, okay? And then, but I do power walking with the arms going this way, and I'm doing all this, breathing the, uh, breathe in the O2 out with the CO2, you know? <sighs> anyway, um, and then I go to the gym, and it's chest, back, shoulders, arms, legs, and abs. And I don't... Um, I won't take my shirt off for you because there's, I don't want to show off my shortcomings. Right. Um, but I just try to keep as tight as I can and try not to lose. Uh, but unfortunately, oh. gravity is starting to win. Well, if you want to live to 100, you got to, you got to, you know, diet and exercise, I imagine, right? Yeah. And uh, Ecuador yeah. has fantastic fruits. Um, Wanamana. Uh, I mean, honestly. After we're done, Google fruits of Ecuador, and there's about six fruits you've never heard of, and they look strange, but I love it, you know. And I, um, and then if I go to a fine restaurant, um, I have red wine with my meal. Okay. Helps, and, the, uh, helps the blood cells, right? Is that white it's blood cells? It's or? supposed to be uh, makes the platelets in your artery less sticky. Okay. And it's it's got reservatrol in it, you know, the and um at least that's what I tell myself gives me permission to have a little wine. Right. Okay. Let's get to some more questions here. Yeah, everyone, if you want to send in your questions, please do so. Uh I've just got one more question before we go to the next super chat. Um someone you and Perfect worked with during this period was uh the Ultimate Warrior. Um I would imagine you've got a few Ultimate Warrior stories. Yeah, you know, um, he got remarried. He had two beautiful daughters. I saw them in the WrestleMania. Uh, no, the uh, when I inducted my brother into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So I would really rather not say anything negative about Ultimate War because he's got those two little girls that are now big girls. It's just that there was a girl with me in New Orleans the year before I inducted my brother. And they didn't want to put him in, in New Orleans because they only like to do one posthumous inductee per year. 
And that year, the dead person was um, Paul Bearer. Oh. Okay. So I had a girl with me as a date. And she kept saying, can I meet this guy? Can I meet this, that way, that guy? He said, oh, there's the ultimate warrior. Can you introduce me to him? And I said, no, if you want to meet him, you're going to have to do it yourself. She says, why not? I said, I don't like him. And I have nothing to say to him. And I don't want to go near him. Wow. And, you know, how do I feel about he only lived a few more days? Um, he was just a guy that had a fantastic body that they fell in love with. They gave him a mega push and he never learned to work. You know, he, he, had, he had no respect for the business. He had no respect for anybody except ultimate and warrior. Wow. And, and it was that selfish greed that caused his career to curtail. Right. Now, I, I just said I didn't want to say anything bad about him, and I just did. But I, at least I was vague about it. Right. Uh, he was, um, let's put it this way, he was not a nice man, and I apologize to anybody I'm hurting, uh, but it's just that when you invited me on this show, I thought I would at least try my best to be honest. Well, that's what we like here, man. We like to be truthful and honest and give your honest opinion. But I'll be honest, his greatest match was against your brother, Randy. That yeah, I Randy seen. liked him. And what Randy would do is he wouldn't have to make a list because he had a razor blade mind, okay? Mm -hmm. he, in his mind, he made a list of everything he did well and everything he didn't do well. And Randy would make sure all the things that Ultimate Warrior did well was in the match. And he, he, he wouldn't let him do the other stuff. Okay. And, you know, Randy watched several of his tapes and decided, I can work with this. And, we, right. and uh, boy, wasn't it a great match? You know, it, it was something. Well, like I said, it was the best match i ever seen Warrior have by far. Yeah. And it was in uh, Wembley Stadium. That's right. Is that where it was? I thought... So so, uh, they had two, uh, Mania 7 and uh, Mania Seven Summer, is Summer, yeah. SummerSlam 92 for the title. And I remember being there early, and we didn't have Google. I didn't, nobody had a cell phone. Nobody had anything like that. Uh -huh. And I had written a poem for the evening, and it was the Beverly Brothers Against the Natural Disasters. Yes. Right, right. right. Okay, Typhoon and Earthquake. And, uh, earthquake. Yeah. And, you know, I was just thinking, I was, I was sitting by myself looking at this fantastic Wembley Stadium, which I understand has been torn down. Uh, yeah, they've rebuilt it. Right, and I I said, well, you're, like I said, no cell phone, no Google, nothing. I said, I'm going to take a walk, and maybe I can run into somebody that can explain to me, this is a famous building, and I should put it in a poem. Mm. Okay, and Vince liked my poems very short. He wanted a good beginning and a good ending and the two close together like that. <laughs> yeah. And otherwise, he would uh, call me by God's last name, damn it, you know? Right, right, so, right, right. So anyway, <clears throat> let me see if I can remember it. In my almost 68-year-old brain, it goes, I saw a plaque by the box office and it explained everything about this building that I needed to know. And I wrote it down, everything that was on the plaque, and then I wrote this poem. From the home of the Olympic Games of 1948 to the World Cup of 1966. I know the date. Now it's SummerSlam at Wembley, and the genius holds the key. Behold the world, behold the future champions, the brothers Beverly. So uh, now I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I tell you what, um, I thought that was concise, got the building over and then brought it to what we're going to do today. And yeah. then of course we failed, but you know, that you have to go in there with all the confidence in the world. So, um, yeah, that was my, uh, my final pay-per-view of my life. And it was, um, we went out with a blaze of glory. Hell of a match. What a crowd. 
Yeah, that um, was like eighty thousand, right? Wembley. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. Wow. And uh, the only more impressive crowd in that building was when Michael Jackson did two sellouts in two different days. Yep. Uh, one after the other, he wow. sorted out both times. Wow. You know, and uh, he. Uh, then finally, they got his nose. You ever have they seen that game? Got your nose. Well, they really got his nose. I think he lost his nose with all the plastic surgery, didn't he? Yeah. In, <laughs> in, in the, I remember in Thriller, he looked, that was his second nose job. He looked better than the girl. But then right. he kept, but then he kept more nose jobs, more nose jobs until finally he had one of these. Right. Yeah. If right. they, you know what? I think, I think you leave yourself alone. You know, right. that's the key to the, Plastic well, surgery. nowadays, these women, man, they're getting uh, uh, butt implants and ab implants and oh. all the Botox and Jesus Christ. Do squats I, if you want to ask. I met, I met a girl from Colombia. She had like a big circle and right. it looked so ridiculously not real. Uh, and, and, you know, it's like if I had a cubic zirconium, uh, I don't have any jewelry, but... If I had a fake diamond here, if it was small enough, you might believe it. But if it was as big as the Hope Diamond, you'd know there was something wrong. Right, right. You know, so believable sizes, just a little booty, you know, if you got a problem with that. Yeah. Or or just, uh, Renee, just put them in the squat bar. That's you know, it. It's all it's it takes. Squats. Fuck. All right, let's get to some more questions here. Yep. Dante, uh, any good Mr. Fuji ribs? Yes, I was afraid of Mr. Fuji, and uh, I made sure that he didn't rib me. I just, I just, very respectful to Fuji. If he made a joke with me, I laughed at it. I didn't come back uh, because that guy was famous. Well, the thing is, in 1967 and 68, I was 12 and 13 years old, and I happened to know that Mr. Fuji and Curtis Iakea were both, well, they're gone now, but they had mob ties oh. and they were enforcers. And there's a lot of um, unsolved murders in Hawaii. Wow, okay? exclusive. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, Mr. Fuji was absolutely nobody to mess with. Wow. And he had a, he, I mean, if he, no matter what he did to you, he could sleep like a baby because, and then Curtis Iakea was known as one of the probably, just a matter of opinion, the greatest interview in the world. Okay. Really? Yeah. And he had a great personality. He was an interesting person to talk to. And believe it or not, my brother was having trouble with his interviews and he came to me for help. And this is before we got to the Maritimes. Okay. And he says, yeah, I'm not doing good with my interviews. And I said, I think you're doing good. He says, no, I need some help. I said, well, you, your name is Savage. You wrestle like a savage. You got hair like a savage. Everything about you is savage. Of all the wrestlers that you've seen, who was the greatest savage type interview that you admired? Let's steal it. And he says, I think it's a cross between Pampero Furpo and Curtis Iakea. And these were guys that we met in Hawaii. Right. Now, there was a bumper on their TV show. That's what they play constantly, like 30 times a day. Yeah. And, and um, Pampero Furpo, the wild bull of the pampas, with yeah. hair this big yeah. and a big beard. Yeah. And he says, and don't forget, he is Armenian from Argentina, so he's got a very unusual accent. Right. You couldn't imitate it, okay? He goes, you are watching number one a station in Hawaii. Roar, yeah. Uh, I said, Randy, remember when he did that 100 times a day? Let's hear you read that same thing. He goes, you are watching the number one station in Hawaii. Ooh, yeah. And I went, whoa. I said, What's the, what's the matter? I said, that's brand new money. And then I promise you, he spent the next three months in the bathroom mirror. 
right. working on his interview, working on his interview. And by the time he got out of there, he went from worst to first. And I, the only thing I am so glad, looking back, his interview is so much fun to imitate. Everybody has a Macho Man imitation. Everybody does. Why didn't somebody take that and go to New York and and then Randy would be the the uh, imposter. Right. Yeah. See what I mean? But nobody did it. And when Randy first got to New York, oh yeah, here's the he already had it down. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And um actually I remember your father telling Randy how to get over, and he says, call them fish eaters. <laughs> and there was a guy named Bill McCullough. He was the announcer. Yes, yes. Is he still alive? Uh, I'm not sure. He said, yeah, Bill McCullough, here's the deal. You know, the people from the Maritimes, they're all alike. If you know what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, I know what you're trying to tell. If you know what I'm trying to tell you, they're just a bunch of fish eaters. That's all they are. That's all they are. And my God, did he get over? Really? Like, oh, my. You know, and it's like, <laughs> just because Emil says, holy Jesus Christ, what, 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 what would you tell them uh, they're the fish eaters? And, <laughs> and, 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 so Randy made the fish eater interview. Wow. Yeah. And uh, hey, uh would this impress you? I used to buy the bills, the boats, and I used to buy the sales. <laughs> I used to buy the catches, the fish, sends them home. Oh, the lines, Hit uh... your partner, Sally Brown. Hit your partner, Sally Tabo. Hit your partner, Sally Brown. Fogo, Twilling Gate, Morton's Harbor, all around the circle. And I got five more verses, but you don't want to hear them. But... <laughs> well, you brought up a good point. Do you follow today's product at all? No. Okay. Well, you're not missing much, in my opinion. Do you think the lack of territories, the lack of training grounds is a detriment to today's current predicament we're in with the quality of wrestling? Yes, because where are you going to go have 100,000 bad matches before you get to the big time? That's it. Yeah. You got to be bad before you get good. Yeah. I've had some matches that are cringeworthy. If I would see it, oh, no, don't look, don't show me that. Right. But then, um, like an inchworm, we all have to, it takes time to learn to work. That's and where are you going to learn? On national television, international television, on the internet? You know, it's not easy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we had, um, now I'm quite a bit older than you. I got to go to several different territories and not do well, right. but pick up a little as, you know, I was always trying to learn try to do better, uh, and also try to be a little peculiar because that's the that's what the people want. Yeah. In other words, you don't want to be 100 times a 1,000. You just want to be unique, one of a kind, you know, something special. Yeah. And um, I don't want to – your father gave me a videotape of you many years ago, and he says, holy Jesus Christ, my son is, you know, he's – we're really looking good and everything, and he's doing really well, and uh, maybe you can help him. And I said, um, I can't help him, but I got a friend that can, and yes. that's Nora Greenwald. Molly Holly. Molly Holly. And I said, Molly, I'm going to ask you a favor. Play this video, and if you like it, then take it to the powers that be. But if you don't like it and you don't think he's any good or worth helping, then just let it go. Mm. And she says, this guy's great. And he's got a body and this and this and this, everything and all your athleticism and your physique and all that. See, I didn't take that video anywhere because I didn't have any clout, any power or any friends in high places. Yeah. It had been years since I was around. I gave it to Molly, who was right there. Yeah. And she gave it to the talent association, whichever is, who was, do you know who that was? I think it was John Laurinaitis. Yeah, that could have been it, yes. Mm -hmm. And if I would have brought it to John Laurinaitis, he would have thrown it in the garbage. Right. But yeah. Molly Holly, I, 
you know, you, I had already seen the video and, you know, your father mailed it to me and I said, well, he deserves a break. And then boom, Molly, and then Molly, John Laurinaitis. The next thing you know, you're in OVW. Yeah. Yeah. And then oh, they yeah. tested you. And next thing you know, you're made your debut. Yeah. And uh, if you're anything like your father, the story is a beautiful one. <laughs> yeah, he didn't let me spend any money. I had to send it all home. And then we bought uh, apartment buildings. And now they're all paid off. So. Well, isn't that great? Like, in other words, um, you're not going to miss any meals, are you? No, I'm, I'm very well fed. Yeah. Okay. I uh, got no worries on that end. But, uh, yeah, you mentioned Molly Holly and Nora Greenwald. She, she's she's back. She's an agent backstage, which I think is probably one of their better moves that they've done in a while. A great well, people, ask, people ask me about her, and I'll tell you what. <clears throat> is she a nice girl, as they say? No, she's a saint, in my a opinion. Saint. Yes. Saint. A she saint. is a saint. Uh, she's the most conscientious person ever. Mm -hmm. And if she, I hope she's doing well. And, you know, yeah, okay, I didn't mean to uh, shy away from all those rib questions. Did you ever get ribbed by this guy or the Fuji or, you know, these are famous ribbers. Also, Donna, my kid, you know, trust me, I hate ribs. Yeah, the only guy whose ribs I liked were Owen Hart's because they were psychological ribs. But he never touched you or your equipment. Or your belongings, yeah. Yeah, he never, he was just a guy with a sense of humor. And he never went over that line that, yeah. see, Don and my kid would put a halcyum into your drink, you know, yeah. and then you'd be, you know, is that funny? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, someone could, uh, what if they're in one of their blackouts, they accidentally kill somebody or kill themselves? I mean, jump, you know. There's a hundred you know. things that could happen. Right. And, uh, you know, the thing is, if you have a if you have a drink and you go to the bathroom or something and then come back, that's no longer your drink. Right. You gotta put the thumb in it. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> do that. Because you know, yeah. but do you think Molly Holly would ever put a housey on in somebody's drink? Oh Christ, no. Come on, she wouldn't she would speak. bless your drink with holy water or something. Yeah. Not a positive Pelio speeder de Santi. All you want to get over the lawn. Because me and her used to travel together when I first got and she would take, we would go to church every Sunday. Uh huh. Talk about being a badass, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you would pray for high spots. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I think we just got another super chat, right, James? Yeah. Um, Polly Muffing, thank you. Uh, Mr. Puffer, you are still in top physical, mental, and spiritual form. Thank you for all the entertainment and wisdom over the years. Well, I appreciate that about the spirituality. Um, what I do is there's a YouTube um, and I go with Dr. Wayne Dyer. And he was as as uh, thrifty as I was. I actually paid to see him twice. Wow. And uh, and I actually brought a date to one of those times. So it was seventy five dollars uh, times three. OK, now for me to go see anybody speaking um it would have to be a great great thing yeah. um and it was trust me uh if you want to know spirituality that i'm looking forward to um it is dr wayne dyer and one of the things i had to let go of if you have any animosity in your heart if you're angry about anything let it go otherwise it's like me drinking poison expecting you to die so oh, good. yeah, that's good. That's a good yeah. So you know, just forgive your enemy. And when my daughter was uh, graduated high school, instead of giving her a card, I decided to write all the wisdom I'd had ever learned in my life into two verses. And it went like this: Be humble when victorious. Be noble in defeat. Be there when your neighbor doesn't have enough to eat. Try to love your enemy and always be aware that World Cup or Super Bowl, the tortoise beats the hare. That's a good one. That's a good one. And tortoise and the hare, check out Aesop's Fables. Oh. Okay? And then um, 
World Cup or Super Bowl, that's uh, soccer and football. Well, mm. you know, over in Ecuador, it's football. You know, football. Right. It, everywhere but America, it's football, and it will always be football. Not yeah, soccer. you got it. Yeah, we got an Englishman <laughs> here who's very sensitive about the name of his national yes. sport. Yes, I tried yes, I, I understand that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very <laughs> sensitive. And that. and I was telling you before we went on the air, I did for the love of wrestling in Liverpool last yeah. year, and then I stayed over for three more weeks because I have friends there, and I met the great, phenomenal Marco Pierre White, three star Michelin chef, and the uh, he's got a millions and millions of selling cookbook called um white heat which they are now since it's the 25th anniversary you go on amazon it's white heat 25. so I, we were having fun and i spent four days with a fantastic guy and he said um he did about a thousand limericks and he, he had memorized so what i did on the last day i was going to be there i I took a picture that we had taken and then I put it and I made a limerick about us. And I said, top Michelin chefs can't compare to the legend of Marco Pierre. White Heat 25 keeps romance alive with the stories that he loves to share. And he got emotional and he says, when did you write that? And I said, last night and again this morning. And he says, how did you know all of that about me? I said, you're all over the internet. It's called research, <laughs> you know? And uh, he says, thank you. And he, and I'll tell you what, he got a, he got very emotional. I, you know, he's a big tough guy and I'm a little bit of a mean guy, but I hit him right in the corazon, which is the heart. Yeah. Okay, what is it in French? Coeur. Coeur. In Spanish, corazon. So. You know, uh, and no dirty words. Right. He says, and he said, there are no, he says, there are, there's no way you can tell a limerick without dirty words. And I said, oh, no, I know a limerick that just has medical terms. You know, like, it's what a doctor would say about certain parts of your body and whatever. Right. May right, I right. tell it if it's got no bad words? Of course. Right. Okay. There once was a nympho named Alice. She used a dynamite stick for a phallus. They found her vagina in South Carolina and part of her anus in Dallas. <laughs> and I said, see, no bad words. They're all medical No terms. bad words, no, but we got some super chats here. <laughs> And everyone, I saw everyone get excited because I'm sniffing something. It's vapor rub, everyone. So don't get too excited. Yeah. Vicks vapor rub? Vapor yeah, rub. I've got a code. So everyone uh -huh. likes to jump to conclusions whenever <laughs> we play with our noses on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's horrible. Uh, raw culture, oh. thank you. And it all. Oh, this is a good one. You got any stories about Billy Jack, Lenny? Yeah, my brother loved him. And um, they got along fantastically. And he was very hilarious in the car. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You see, people don't realize. And um, he's made a few shoot interviews with some people say, you know, he's an angry man and whatever. And um, the thing is, I really liked Iron Mike Sharp. Right. And uh, he was a little stiff, but he wouldn't hurt you. You know what I mean? You just whack you around a little bit. I 10 times rather work with him than Big Boss Man, who's going to drop you on your head. Oh. Okay, so um, I wasn't there, but it was in Detroit, and the two men faced off. Right. And I believe that Iron Mike Sharp was a gold glove champion of some place, and uh, he was a professional boxer. Probably in Ontario, where he's from, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I believe that Iron Mike Sharp is a very, very, very tough man. Yeah. But somebody has got to lose. Yeah. And Billy Jack Haynes, I only, I'm getting this from the people that were there. Right. 
he came in all covered up and then blocked him and boom, boom, boom. And Mike Sharp, the next, about five days later, his face was swollen up like a monster. Wow. And um, it wasn't a real fight. It was a hundred to nothing. You know, it was a beating up. It was a beating up. Mike Sharp did not land a blow. Not a punch was, not a punch, nothing. So that's the way it was. Um, that's a story. Um, I didn't see the fight, but I saw the results. Um, Billy Jack Haynes looked good. Uh, and uh, like before. Yeah. And Mike Sharp looked like a monster. Right. Like all swollen up like that. Damn. Yeah, from what I hear, Billy Jack was the real deal. Tough, tough. Oh, guy. my gosh. But I give credit to Mike Sharp. He didn't miss a booking. Wow. You know, he came there like a monster and he just got in the ring and just did his best. And, you know, you got to give a guy, uh, even in a losing effort, you got to give him credit for showing up. For showing up. Yeah. All right. Let's get uh, to the next question. Yeah. Speaking of fights, uh, before we go to the next one, were you there between the uh, Dynamite Kid and Shaq Rougeau fight? No, I wasn't there. But right. I will tell you this. And this is going to get me heat with a lot of people, but I don't care. Um, I'm very proud of Jacques Rougeau for doing what he did to that horrible, horrible bully. Okay? And he never... Now, Dynamite never did anything to me because, what did you say? My brother's the macho man. That's it. But I'm telling you what, and hear me now, believe me later, Jacques Rougeau, you ever hear when somebody gets in a fight that that was uncalled for? No, this was called for. Yeah. And the thing is, Raymond Rougeau had a bad knee. But yes. Raymond Rougeau was a tough SOB, yeah. but not with a bad knee. You see what I mean? Right. So, um, they okay, Jacques told me he had a roll of quarters in his fist. That will solidify your fist. Yeah, and make it more of a weapon. He only had a chance to boom, boom, and then keep. Well, that his. I'll tell you what. I wasn't there, but right after that, it was Dynamite and Davy Boy that were in um, France and Italy on a tour, and I was with them then. And Dynamite had his teeth knocked out. Knocked out, right? Yeah, incredible. Yeah, and like I say, I give Dynamite credit. He got in that ring and performed, even though I'm sure his face was killing him. Right. So if I can say one good thing about the loser, he's a winner too. Yeah. For showing up, getting paid, and uh, being a man. Yeah. Okay, but Jacques became my hero that day. Mm -hmm. Because look at all the people that Dynamite hurt on purpose. And he got revenge for all of those people that didn't have the guts or had too many brains to do something about it. Right. And, and I'll tell you what, beating up Dynamite was no easy task. Anybody will tell you that. Tough guy, right? And Davy Boy. I mean, give them give him both credit. Right. But he just, the parting of the waves, boom, and it was over. Knocked and out his teeth. I wasn't there, but I like to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> the, the other fight that I witnessed was um, Dan Spivey beat the living hell out of Adrian Adonis. Right. In, in I heard Flint, about Michigan. Yes. Flint, Michigan. And uh, Vince was in love with Adrian because Adrian reminded Vince of Dr. Jerry Graham. That was his favorite wrestler, right? Yes. And, and I'll tell you what, Adrian was a great wrestler, yeah. but he did a lot of mind-blowing drugs before the match, oh. okay? And I don't want to give an excuse, but everything. Boy, Danny Spivey was Mr. Quiet, handsome, you know, never said a word, never said a negative word. And they get in the ring, match starts, sleeper hold. How many matches have you ever seen start with a sleeper hold? Adonis yeah. put a sleeper and tried to put him out. 
Spivey backed him up, and he's a left-handed guy, so left hand, left hand, left hand. And it's on. Every time he threw the punch, it landed. Blood everywhere. In the ring. In the ring. And then Earl Hebner didn't know what to do because Adrian's going over, but Adrian's outside the ring. Right. So, so Spivey says, just push me and disqualify me. You know, boom, boom, boom. They raise Adonis's hand. Adonis comes into the dressing room. You know, he's, well, he's probably on some medicine that can't feel pain. He tries a leg dive on Dan Spivey. Big mistake. Boom, boom, boom. Left, left, left. More blood. And he, he tried the leg dive from a far distance. You right. got to get up close. Yeah. But when Dan Spivey, he's about 6'7". Yeah. And he was on the New York Jets. So um, then uh, maybe you've heard that Randy didn't let a, like a lot of people in, his, in Elizabeth's locker room. Right. But Randy grabs uh, Spivey, puts him in uh, his locker room, his private locker room. And, and he brings me in there and he says, Lanny, get your ass upstairs and get Spivey a big bucket of ice so he can soak his fist. Wow. Well, he became my John Wayne hero. I jumped up, got that ice, brought it back. He put his fist in the ice and he, and he says, I want you to stay here because I don't want any more fighting. Randy wow. told Spivey. Wow. He says, nobody knows we're here. Let's leave it at that. The fight is over. There's no more punches to be thrown. That's so, like a locker room leader right there. That's really Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. Ra Randy would, uh, and um, Randy was on probation when he first came in because he was known as a hothead. And Vince had warned him, any fighting, you're gone. Wow. So Randy never had a fight in the WWE. Right. So, but... Um, a lot of people liked Adrian and a lot of people hated him. Okay. I was in the second group and really? I would, oh yeah, he was, uh, he was a, well, I don't want to, just in case his widow gets a hold of this interview, let me just say that um, he did a lot of uh, drugs okay. and a lot of his behavior problems were, you know, the thing is, this business can be so easy and so much fun if we just cooperate. But it doesn't have to be uh, skullduggery or violence or anything like that, but yet it is. Yet Bruiser Brody was murdered in Bayamon, Puerto Rico, you know, and why can't we just get along, right? What a wonderful world it would be, but uh, it's not to but, be, but right? You got, but you got these people that make it impossible to get along, you know? Yeah. Yeah. C'est la vie. On dit en français, c'est la vie. C'est la vie. C'est la vie. We got some more questions here. We got to get yeah, them. Yeah, great story. Um, Howdy, uh, any Jose Lavario stories? I'll be right back, guys. I got to go to the bathroom. Okay. Jose Lavario stories. Yeah. Um, I never actually met him, but... Um, I heard a lot of stories about him and uh, and I saw him wrestling even when he was an older man and he still was an excellent worker in my opinion and I believe he trained um, Shawn Michaels yes and anybody that trained Shawn Michaels deserves a trophy because Shawn was one of the all-time greats So anyway, now that uh, Rene is in the, uh, the bathroom, and the, you can ask me some stuff. You, you get to talk now for a while. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's talk about Rene. Let's, let's tell me how you really, really feel. <laughs> uh, no, I'll that... tell you what. I'm just I'm proud of the fact that, I, that Emil gave me the videotape, and I gave mm -hmm. it to Nora Greenwald, and she gave it to John Laurinaitis, and good yeah. for him. You know, because yeah. I, I feel good that I brought a good man to the WWE. Yeah, uh, that's great. That is um, really is uh, another Billy Jack Haynes story here from Raw Culture. How involved in the mafia was he? Boy, I didn't hear anything about that. Was he? 
for I did. That's the first I've heard of it. <laughs> wow. I tell you what, if I were involved in the mafia, I wouldn't tell you. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> so, uh, the one here, um, last not bad, Lanny's the best guest you guys have brought on. Thank you. Lars Newtbar, fan. Okay, thank you, Lars. Um, I appreciate that. And um, I don't do a lot of interviews, but when Renee asked me, I said absolutely yes. But yeah. um, I have to admit that I turned down almost every podcast I've ever been in, I've ever been asked to be in, because I am retired. Yes. And I, and when I say retired, I mean I don't do a thing all day. The aristocratic, <laughs> the aristocratic pleasure of doing absolutely nothing. And in the words of Winnie the Pooh. Everybody says nothing's impossible, but I do nothing every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. And uh, speaking of Ecuador, so Fixstream Bob has just sent this one. Uh, did you learn any, sorry if I mispronounce it, Cuchea uh, in Ecuador? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, did I learn any, I can't pronounce it, uh, but you, uh... that is the indigenous people. Okay, right. and on the 15th, I'm going to a town called Cotacachi, Otavalo, and Ibarra. And they are populated, especially Cotacachi and Otavalo, with indigenous people, which were the original people that were living there when the Spanish conquistadors came in. Okay, so um, I, the, the people that speak that language also speak Spanish. But if I really wanted to impress somebody, I would learn that language and uh, people would be amazed. But uh, anyway, I used to, as the genius, I used to say, um, I speak 11 languages. Escuchen, por favor. Santana comes from Mexico. Yo hablo muchos mejor. The French I speak is magnifique. They told me in Paris, my Italians molto bene. I learned when I was three. I speak Latin, Greek, and Russian, Hebrew, and Portuguese. I speak Swedish and Norwegian. Now I'm learning Japanese. And then it goes on and on. What? What's that? <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking Japanese. I say honto means like, really? Okay, so it goes, Ichi ni sanshi go, rokalichi hachi kuju. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I just eight, counted eight, to, eight. I just counted to ten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, here we go. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I get my nails done, and they're all Venezuelan girls that do my nails. Oh, and wow. uh, pedicure, manicure. Nice. And uh, back in the States, there used to be a lot of Vietnamese girls that did it. Mm -hmm. And I would go, Mo Kai Babo Nam Sai Bai Tam Shim Wee. Oh, you would come to 10, oh. <laughs> you know, in Vietnamese. So how many how many languages can you count the ten in, Lanny? You just did about four or five. Oh, um, the thing is, the only I, I'm not a genius. Okay, that was a nickname and a gimmick. <laughs> right. But the only thing that I can say that was a hundred percent real, the poetry was all mine. The lousy ones, the good ones, and I threw the frisbees, and people say, "Where'd you get that idea?" From Al Costello. Do you know who that is? He, the kangaroo. So, yeah. yeah. Al Costello and Roy Hefferman were the fabulous kangaroos managed by Wild Red Berry. And then as soon as Hefferman stopped, then it was Don Kent. And then they get a new manager, George Cannon. But it was always Al Costello. And Randy and I were just boys hanging around the matches watching my dad. They would bring a boomerang to the ring carved right. by an aborigine which is the original Australian. Yeah. And if they threw that to the audience, they'd kill somebody. Right. But they had these little cardboard uh, boomerangs made with a picture of Al Costello, Roy Hefferman, and some information about the, royal, uh, the fabulous kangaroos. They would throw these to the audience. Randy and I would scamper and get them and everything. Uh, one time I got one and Randy ripped it out of my hand and it was his now. Okay, but that was the alpha male. Right. So um, I'm thinking to myself, okay, they're going to give me the poetry gimmick. What could I throw to the audience? I can't throw boomerangs because I'm not Australian. 
And then it hit me, Frisbees. So I wrote a poem on a Frisbee, and then I had 500 made. And right at the time that I was going to have to reorder, the WWE, um, they came to me, and they said, would you mind if we market these? I said, would I mind? Please, you know, have at it. And then they sold them for $3 per Frisbee, and I would always, win, lose, or draw, go to the venue and sign them, whether they bought a Frisbee or didn't. I would just be, and we sold out every night, and then I had them bring more because that's how you uh, sell merchandise. Yeah. I just came back from Germany, and I made more money with merchandise than I made for my guarantee of what I was going to make. In Germany? You yes. made more money? Mm-hmm. Damn. Is there like yeah. usually frugal over there? Well, I'll tell you what. I was just be nice to the people. Yeah. Sign every, every, anything they have, pictures, whatever. And um, it was a very good crowd. Yeah. And they had a lot of interest. And I just wouldn't, um, I wouldn't stop. I was, don't you want to take a rest? No. Nope. Keep signing. And then they gave me, I had all this euro and then uh, traded in for U.S. dollars. Yeah, one thing about Germany and Japan, they, they respect their elders. They they usually come out to see the old timers, right? The yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm um, very proud to say that I'm from the 80s, and uh, there's very few of us less left, yeah. and I'm going to try to prove that you can be from the 80s and still live to be 100. There you go. Well, I'm rooting for you, Lanny. Let me well, ask you a question, you. Lanny. If you were ever offered... The opportunity to become a, like a backstage agent with like say AEW or even WWE, I mean, I think you'd be perfect for that role. Would you? Would well, you uh, thank you very uh, much. Uh, I'd uh, let's put it this way: um, I would listen to any offer. Yeah, but um, I'm also very happy doing absolutely nothing. So, <laughs> um, and I'll and I'll, and I'll be perfectly honest with you: um, in order to get to Germany. I went from Quito, Ecuador, to Bogota, Colombia, Bogota, Colombia, to um, um, Barcelona, Spain, Barcelona, Spain, to Hamburg, Germany, and then to leave. I went from Hamburg, Germany, to Paris, France, Paris, France, to Atlanta, Georgia, and then five hours nonstop to Quito, and. And by the time I was done with all that flying, I looked and felt like something that dropped out of a cat's ass. Right. (laughs) People don't realize how much the traveling takes out of us. Like, boy. So I just, what I tried to do is just slept all night and took a nap after that and got back in the gym slowly. But, you know, it's like, it takes a lot out of you. Uh, but I, if somebody made me an offer, I'd listen. You'd because listen. you can't be too thin or too rich. Right. No, I think you, I mean, with your knowledge, I mean, Jesus, you and your family have been around the business. I mean, you were a part promoter. You were a talent. You did bad guy, good guy. You, I mean, you know the ropes, all the experience. I mean, I think you'd be perfect for that. At least given right. the opportunity to try it, right? Let's get through these super chats because I don't want to waste any more Lanny's time. You know, I want to make sure everybody uh, gets their answers. Yep. Uh, Lanny, any memories of Dino Bravo? Yeah, I'm sorry. He really um, he got involved in the cigarettes and he got involved with some unscrupulous people. And then I guess he made a mistake. I saw the same thing you saw on the darker side of the ring. Yeah. Yes. Um, what a fantastic guy. Um, I have no idea what he did wrong. It's just don't get rich quick, folks. Get rich slowly. Okay? Pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. That's how you win the game. You don't need to get rich all at once. And I guess I'm sorry to say he got involved with some bad people. Yeah, I think he. I think he was born into that. Like originally, he was born into that type of family. Yeah, right? but he could have rejected it. He could have stayed apart from it. Yeah, you're but, right. You know, he. I guess he had a 
Mercedes Benz and a home that was too big, you know, and a hell of a mortgage. And when the when the when the wrestling business is done with you, they are done with you, you know. And you know they he was there quite. A, he did a hell of a career, but it was over now. You know, nobody. You know, all it takes is one guy not to like you, and it's over. That's it. It's true. It's not right. true. Uh, next one, uh, Spike Fast Racing. Welcome to the show. Oh, Fast- yeah. Ask Lanny about his deal with Tony Little's Gazelle commercials. Did he profit well from the appearances on the infomercials? Did he really use the Gazelle or just pay to endorse? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really used the Gazelle, and I really wrote a letter um, thanking them because I was losing weight and it was working. Plus, I liked the fact that it was gentle on the joints, easy on the credit card. And the guy calls me up and says, hey, would you endorse it for us? So it all, you know, and then I said, yeah, I'll do my best. So they used me once and then twice. And um, they were very generous. And I guess if you want to see, um, just go on my website, uh, thegeniuslannypoffo.com, and it's and it's there. The only thing that I do to make money now, uh, I don't have a job and I don't do anything, but I'm on Cameo. Now, guess who is on Cameo and charges the most? Give up? On that. $2,000, Caitlyn Jenner. No oh. way. <laughs> yeah. But for me, $50, I'll tell you anything you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the one here, Polly Muffing, thank you. Uh, favorite movies, Lenny? My favorite movie of all time is Casablanca, 1942. Um, Humphrey Bogart, um, uh, Ingrid Bergman, and wow, what a, and uh, that was also, let me see. Um, of course, Gone with the Wind. Um, I'll tell you a movie you should see is um, it was George Pappard and um, Robert Mitchum in Home from the Hill, directed by Vincent Minnelli, Liza Minnelli's father and the husband of Judy Garland. Yes. So, but my favorite movie is Casablanca. In fact, I like it so much. As soon as we're done with this interview, I'm going to watch it again before going to before going to bed. There we go. <laughs> with that being said, what's your favorite match of all time, Lanny? Like as a fan? Okay, as a fan, 1961, Buddy Nature Boy Rogers Pat versus Pat O'Connor. Hey. Okay. Yes, sir. And Comiskey Park. What's that? Comiskey Park. Two out of three falls. There you go. You okay? And and anybody that wants to watch it, go on YouTube, yeah. and put, type it in and watch it tonight. And then that's uh, okay. Pat O'Connor versus uh, Buddy Rogers. That's one. Yeah. Number two in the seventies, you would have to go with Dory Funk Jr. against Jack Briscoe. Yeah. And number three in the eighties, you would have to go with. Macho Man Randy Savage versus Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Yes. yes. And unfortunately, in the 90s, that's when I quit watching. Because, okay, I just, I cease to become a fan anymore. Okay, because if I'm not in it, I don't want to see it. Okay, and I don't mean to be rude. It's just that even baseball that I love, I find it much easier to watch the highlights Okay, instead of all the scratching and spitting that goes on. And, you know, I don't have two and a half hours or three hours to watch a game, but I want to see the great highlights of the game. Okay. And then um, after Macho Man against Steamboat, um, I just want to say that when Randy left the WWF, WWE for the WCW, he didn't, he didn't want to leave. But he, 
he had an idea that he could end his career with a better match than he had with Steamboat by working with Shawn Michaels. That's right, yes. And he, and it would build it up to a giant crescendo. And his idea was if Shawn Michaels loses, he loses his hair. Oh. And if Randy loses, since his hair was nothing to speak of, he would lose his career. Wow. Hair was... And then and then be and then be relegated to the announcer's desk. Right. So what happened was they said, Randy, that's a great idea, but we're having a youth movement, and the best thing you can do is hang on to the microphone. So he said, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was elderly, but I think I'll get a second opinion on that. So he calls the WCW. He said, is that offer still on the table? Okay, boom, he goes there. And then he goes to Raleigh, North Carolina and takes Slim Jim with. Wow. Can, can, I want to say something and try not to laugh. Okay. You know what the WWE was going to replace Macho Man with for the Slim Jim? I heard this. It was Bam Bam, wasn't it? Bam Bam Bigelow. Now, let me ask, before you start laughing, Imitate Bam Bam. You can't. Right. Because he's just another fat, repulsive piece of excrement. Screaming Fat Guy magazine. So I take it, I take it, I take it you and Bam Bam didn't go on very well. Just I didn't like him at all. And um, there was nothing about if I were a fan, I would never, never pay money to see it, pay a ticket to see Bam Bam. Mm. You mentioned Eduardo Carpentier. I'd pay to see him at any stage of his career. Right. He was a young man. He was an old man. He had a long career. Naturally, he was better when he was young. Everybody is. But, um, no, I didn't like Bam Bam whatsoever. And I thought he was the least talented wrestler ever to get a push. And, uh, boy, did it go to his head. Mm. And um, But I will give him credit for one thing. Um, I understand in the last years of his life, some building caught on fire and he went into the building and saved two kids. Yeah, I heard so, that. So get good for him. Um, on the bad side, um, when he divorced his wife and everything, um, he, he, he didn't pay child support. Uh, you know, and so some good, some bad. But even a bad guy's got some good. Mm. You know, but uh, I... Unfortunately, Okay, I was his job guy when he first came in. And this is like shortly before I became the genius. Mm. He didn't wash his gear. And he got he got me in a leg scissors around my okay, so I'm now I'm trapped <laughs> in, a, in a leg scissors. This fat bastard has got me in a leg scissors. And I'm breathing in something that smells like, let me explain, uh, a combination <laughs> of uh, ammonia and cat piss. Oh. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell's wrong with me to be locked into this guy that doesn't wash his gear and he's got me like this. Yeah. And I said, I have made a bad career choice here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I got to do a job for this unmarketable fat piece of crap mm -hmm. that couldn't get over if his hair were on fire. You know, he had a tattoo of a yeah, flame. tattooed flames, right? Yeah. yeah. I said he could. I wouldn't pay to see that guy, no matter what he was going to do. So anyway, um, but give him credit. Boy, didn't he have a great match with uh, that football player, LT? Yeah. Good for him. I mean, let's put it this way: I will knock a guy on your show, right. but when he does something good, you got to give it to him, right? Yeah. Don't yeah. take everything point, away from him. Right. If you're going to point out the bad, you might as well point out the good too, right? That's yeah. right. Okay, I think we have our last Super Chat of the night, and then we can let Lanny go and uh, watch his Casablanca. Yeah. Uh, Eric Machi, uh, thanks for coming on, Lanny. All-time great guest. This is Eric. Thank you, Eric. And uh, I will pay you later. But, uh, no, honestly, the truth is um, – I do not do podcasts. I did 20 episodes of my own. Yeah. Um, I had a fantastic guy to work with, J.P. Zarka. He did all the work. Um, but 
I cannot tell you how lazy I've become. Okay, I just don't want to do anything anymore. And he, I know he did all the work, but it was still a stress. And after 20 episodes, I think it was time to let it go. And um, when you asked me to do this, Renee, yeah. uh, there was absolutely no way our families go back all the way to Indianapolis in the early 60s. Yeah. And my father loved Emil. And believe it or not, my brother did too. They were like oil and water, but my brother respected your father. Okay, they just had a... My brother thinks that there's only one way to do something, it's his own. You see what I mean? Yeah. And your father knew the psychology of the maritime people. Right. And, you know, it's, people aren't, fans aren't all, they're not the same everywhere you go. They're different mm -hmm. everywhere you go. Yeah. And he knew the psychology of the um, maritime fan from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI. Yep. And even Newfoundland. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. it's, um, I just want to say before we go, I didn't think twice about accepting your offer, but if anybody's listening, no, I don't accept, I don't do these. Okay. I am exhausted. I am saturated and I don't like it anymore, but I've enjoyed the hell out of this one because I've never had a host leave to go to the bathroom. And come back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, finally an honest man. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got I drink a lot of uh I'm trying to live to be at least 60. So I gotta drink my How water. How old are you now? I'll be 39 next week, Lanny. Okay, I got married um in uh, Moncton. Yeah, and my best man was Emil. The maid of honor was your mother. Yeah, and she was pregnant with you. So I was there. Yes. And uh, and your brother was hanging about. Wow. Yeah, and I was. Yeah. So I was I was like, uh, what's that? A groomsman or whatever? You were in the belly. I was in the belly. Yeah. So I was okay, you were still it. gestating and kicking up a fuss. And <laughs> what happened was, um, you know, OK, our marriage ended in divorce, mm. but I did much better than O.J. Simpson. True. True. Okay, and they can't get me for, you know, murder because she's still alive and she's 70 years old. Oh, she was older than you. Two years older, yes. Oh, okay. I was 28. She was 30 when we were married. Okay. We lived together for three years previously. Right. And then, uh, you know, um, and I, I asked myself, was it worth it? And I say, you're damn right it was. Because now I got a beautiful daughter. Yeah. And two beautiful grandsons. And yes, it was worth it. But your daughter but, and I are the same age, right? Uh, she was born May 29th, 1984. Okay, so yeah, so she'll be 39 next year. On May 29th, yeah. yeah. And you are already... I'll be 39 next week. You had to be older because um, you were just about to be born right, during right. this service. Right. And um, Paula and Emil were very dear friends of mine. And uh, I loved being in the working for um, your organization. And um, every moment was fun. And a lot of people are amazed, as bad a driver as I was, that I lived this long. But now <laughs> I'm telling you, I walk everywhere. I do not own a car. Everybody's kind of crazy. Local in La here. And you meet them, and they're not in a hurry, but they're all—they're all very, very. Um, they drive too fast here, okay. so I—I I have Uber, I have uh, several other apps to get a to get a ride, and just a taxi. So okay. I'm—it's um, the sweet life. And um, if you ever want to come visit, if you ever want to bring your wife in for a visit. Yeah. Um, come on down. I'll treat you as good as I can. Awesome. I appreciate that so much, Lanny. And uh, I'll definitely take you up on that offer. And, and are, you're, are you married to a Japanese woman? Yes, sir. Yeah, we've been married for 13 years. I promise when I come to your house, I'll take my shoes off and before I enter. 
<laughs> yeah, because she'll slap you. <laughs> well, I happen to know they're the cleanest people in the world, uh, cleaner than Mike Sharp. Right, right. No, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. Uh, yeah, I'm lucky. Um, a North American woman and I don't really regel. I mean, they're lovely to look at, but as far as a relationship, I think I Japanese is the way for me. So. Well, South American women are very good to me. They even pretend to be pleasantly enthused as I mount. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something rare for me. Like, yay. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lanny, it was a pleasure. And thank you so much. And I want to thank you publicly because if it weren't for you, I might have never achieved the heights that I got to. I mean, you were. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Up. Emil sent me the video. And if I wasn't impressed with your video, I would have never given it to Nora. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, and and she, if she didn't like it, she wouldn't have given it to Lauren Ice. Right. So, in other words, you had the goods. Wow. And uh, as a matter of fact, Emil said, holy Jesus, great, do you, do you, do you think you can get my, my boy in the WCW? And I said, I called him up and I said, he's too good for the WCW. Let's take him to Vince. Uh, you know, well, I mean, why aim low? Let's aim high. Let's aim high. You, you, know, you know there's only one. Right. And uh, how, long, how long were you there anyway? Uh, almost six years. Well, it's a life-changing decision, and here, and may your may your interest always accrue. Ah, uh, uh, it is, it is. Yeah. Well, Lanny, thank you again, and uh, I'm sure our fans love to love to hear from you. And uh, I'll definitely keep in touch, and maybe go see you down in Ecuador. Okay. Yes. Um, Adnan O Casey taught me to do that, and. Because I'm writing a new book, Playing With Myself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lion, you take care, okay? All right, thank you. Thank All you, right, brother. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.